Oui, donc le premier exposé ce matin est fait par Piotr Kroskel qui parle d'antigravité à la Carlo Dauchen. Bien, alors euh, bonjour. D'abord, merci beaucoup pour cette invitation. C'est un grand honneur et plaisir de parler dans euh, ce séminaire. Euh, donc, euh, je vois au moins un collègue qui n'est pas francophone d'origine, mais toi, tu parles français peut-être. Je ne sais pas si ce que je dois faire mon exposé en français ou en anglais. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y a des non-francophones dans la salle Ok, so for the sake of, of uh, the non-French speaking colleagues, I, my talk will be in English. And uh, what I was asked uh, it was to present you the, a beautiful paper by Carlo Tone Schoen. Uh, so Alessandro is actually in the audience. It's a pleasure to have him here. And he's going to correct me whenever I say something wrong. But uh, uh, the, this is the... Uh, a short version of the theorem. If you want to see the full version with all the details, you you can look at it in their paper. But this is uh, the theorem tells you the following. So if you have a asymptotically flat initial data for vacuum Einstein equations, something happens. So before we just go into understanding what happens and what exactly this theorem says. Uh, it would probably make sense that I explain you the context a little bit. So uh, we're starting with uh, an initial data set for vacuum Einstein equations. So what is this about? Well, vacuum Einstein equations, you're looking for a Lorentzian metric, which I'm going to write for to make sure that this is the four-dimensional object. And in fact, the Lorentzian manifold. And these things are supposed to satisfy the Ricci tensor of this four-dimensional metric should be zero. Uh, or if you have a cosmological constant, you're going to have a proportional to the metric. Uh, I'm going to, most of the talk, it's going to be without a cosmological constant, so uh, uh, it's going to be zero. And uh, why is this moving? Okay. Uh, and the, uh, there is a beautiful theorem uh, which has been proved by Madame uh, choquet bruat or actually fourest bruat at the time, which says that if you want to construct solutions of these equations, uh, because this metric is Lorentzian, you can do it using a Cauchy problem uh, because these equations are in a very precise sense hyperbolic. So you can think of this as a wave equation for the metric, a nonlinear wave equation. And in order to solve this problem, uh, you're going to take a space-like surface sigma, so a hypersurface, co-dimension one object in this four-dimensional space-time, so a three-dimensional uh, three Riemannian manifold. Uh, so there will be a metric living on this, a Riemannian metric, which will serve as part of the initial data for this four-dimensional metric. So the space part of this four-dimensional metric will be this metric G. So this is a second-order equation. You need uh, the fields and their derivatives. So the values of the fields are going to be uh, the free data. Or we're going to see they're not that free, but the data which are zero-order data would be a Riemannian metric on this manifold, and you need something like the derivative of the metric at t equals zero. And this thing is going to be, well, a metric is a symmetric uh, tensor with two indices, so this thing is going to be encoded in a symmetric tensor with two indices, which uh, uh, physicists call k, and uh, this is, uh, in fact, the extrinsic curvature of the surface sigma in this space-time mg4 once you have constructed your space-time. Okay? So once you have your space-time, you can induce from the four-dimensional metric a uh, three-dimensional metric on this hypersurface at the g. And this is a hypersurface. It has an extrinsic curvature tensor. This is the same k. So once you have a solution, you can just induce them on the surface. On the other hand, that's the beautiful theorem of uh, Ivan choquet bruat that uh, given such data, you can, there exists a unique space-time satisfying these equations, provided that, and this is the 
uh, that's where it hurts, uh, pro provided certain constraint equations are satisfied. So constraint equations are an equation for a coupled system of equations for this guy, for these two guys. Well, one is, uh, well, simple or simple, or not simple, it's probably not that simple, actually. It's telling you that the Ricci scalar of this three-dimensional metric should be related to this extrinsic curvature tensor in this form. And in fact, if you had a cosmological constant, you would add a, a term to lambda here, which I'm not going to add. Uh, so, uh, and this is in vacuum. Of course, if you have matter fields, you'll have some extra terms here. But in vacuum, if you just want a vacuum Lorentzian metric, so you have to satisfy this equation. This is called the scalar constraint equation. And uh, there is another equation, which is called the vector constraint equation, which is mainly an equation for this guy. So uh, for a mathematician, maybe the way you're going to understand it best, it's going to be to write it like that. Uh, and if you're a physicist, you probably won't understand what I wrote. You're going to write it in this form. Okay, so this is the index notation for, for this equation. So divergence of this tensor, which has two indices, well, you have to subtract it, trace, and, and this, you have to do this. Okay, so this is, the, uh, this is called the vector constraint equation. Good. So these are then the initial data for the vacuum Einstein equations. So if you want to detect gravitational waves like people think they have, well, you need a space time so you can have to construct solutions. You have to model the system. So one way of modeling this is you have to look at all possible solutions of these equations which have or do not have gravitational waves and study how they behave, how they evolve. Then you put it in your machine and you wait for invest uh, uh, probably $600 million now for the LIGOs, uh, and, uh, and eventually you get a small signal in there. So, uh, so the physics is really sitting in these things because this is your universe at our time. And predictability means that we can just, knowing this, we, can, we know what's going to happen with the universe and how black holes are going to collide and what kind of waves are going to emit. So, so these are the initial data set for vacuum Einstein equation, right? So three-dimensional Riemannian manifold with uh, another tensor and the constraint equations have to be satisfied. Now, I actually need a little more. It's not any uh, initial data set, but it's an asymptotically flat initial data set. So uh, the idea is that you want to look at an isolated system. So you have two black holes ro rotating and merging eventually, but at large distances, space-time goes to Minkowski. And one way of encoding this is to say that the initial data have to have some fall-off conditions, uh, and this would be as follows. You are going to require that the components of the metric, so there exists a coordinate system, so that the components of the metric fall off like r to minus some power alpha, where alpha is going to be positive, and uh, maybe the first derivatives are going to fall off one power faster. And if you need 25 derivatives, I'm going to write 25 equations like that. Each time you differentiate, you get one power of r more. And with k would be something similar, but k, k is already a derivative. So uh, k should behave like, like this. And uh, you could say, well, that's all there is. There's a little more to this, because uh, the question is, uh, what should this alpha be? For example, can you take alpha larger than 1? Uh, well, it turns out that you can't. And this is the famous positive energy theorem. To which I'm going to return later, but which says that well, alpha equal 1 is actually the uh, threshold. If it's larger than 1, 
and you impose the constraint equations and regularity so that this is a well behaved uh, so complete manifold or something of this kind uh, and maybe some uh, no, that would be enough, right? So I guess complete would be enough. Then this would be, then Kij would be, uh, well, so then this would be data for Minkowski space time. So what are the data for Minkowski space time? Well, the simplest data would be just to take the Euclidean metric here. This be zero. So if this vanishes, then of course this equation is satisfied. Uh, this is gone, this is gone, and uh, Euclidean, so Euclidean metric scalar curvature zero, right? So this satisfies this. So this would be the simplest version, but of course, if you want, so it would be if this is your Minkowski space time, this would be the slice t equals zero. But of course, if you take a surface like that in Minkowski, why not? Then this will not be flat anymore, and k will not be zero anymore. Right? But I mean, it can still, you know what it means, right? To be of initial data for Minkowski. So alpha larger one is actually, uh, you can prove thousands of theorems from this case, but they're not going to be very interesting. Now, alpha equal one is uh, uh, something that physicists have mostly been using because it's related to the Schwarzschild metric. And so there is a notion of Schwarzschildian asymptotics and I don't know, I, I will need this notion in a couple of slides. And I don't see how I'm not going to raise it meanwhile. So, well, let's hope it stays. Uh, so, uh, where this metric Gij is actually a very uh, precise form, uh, which looks like that. Period. Where m is a constant. And, well, Kij is zero. So when I'm saying period, this would be initial data for something called Schwarzschild metric, and this is your favorite black hole solution. Right? So the black holes that have been merging in the LIGO experiment, they look like that probably, or not very far from it uh, at some stage. So this is an exact solution of this problem. And uh, so not only you have a 1 over R decay towards the Euclidean metric, but the one over term is precise, right? So the one over term is actually precise. So what you could do is just add an error term here, uh, say minus epsilon minus one, and here, and this, this would be asymptotically Schwarzschildian initial data, right? So exactly Schwarzschild would be this, and initial data which go to uh, Schwarzschild will be that with m a constant, and this m is the mass of the system, right? So m is a constant, is the mass of the system. And however, there is a natural threshold, which is the following. If alpha is larger than one half, uh, you can define the mass in general. And maybe I can write the formula for you. Now it's 1 over 16 pi integral uh, of, uh, so you just take integrals over large spheres. You integrate over a sphere and you take some kind of funny combination of partial derivatives of the metric, uh, whatever it is. So this is some kind of magical formula. So you have to sum over i and j. This is the normal. So you just take your metric, calculate this combination y. This one is a long story. Uh, integrate on a large sphere. Go with the sphere to infinity. This is called the mass. And this works in this range. If alpha is smaller than 1 half, you can prove examples which show that this doesn't make sense. So, so this is really a threshold for a well-defined mass. And, uh, and this is a very precise way, a very simple way of measuring the mass. If this, uh, if this metric is exactly Schwarzschildian, you take this integral, you're going to find this number. Right? So there's nothing mysterious about it. So this generalizes this notion to metrics which decay slower. 
Now, I'm emphasizing this decay business because if you're a physicist, you're going to say, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're never going to go large enough so that we can see that it makes any difference. But in, in this theorem, it makes a difference because uh, the, you cannot work with metrics like that to get this theorem. You have to go to metrics which are not Schwarzschildian but have this smaller, uh, this more general behavior. Okay? So, now, so now we know what asymptotically flat initial data set means. And so this is again the theorem. So let me just read it with you now. So we have an asymptotic flat initial data, vacuum Einstein equation. So, so you have a, your surface sigma here with some stuff. Now in this surface, you can find cones. So, well, I'm going to make a 2D version of this three-dimensional picture there. So in this initial data set, you can find cones uh, so that the metric is the original one you started here. Well, the initial data, in fact, are the original one in the smaller cone, right? So there are two cones. Uh, one has an opening slightly larger than the other. So inside this cone, you have exactly the same initial data as you had before. And outside of this, you have Minkowskian data. So outside of this larger cone, you have, right? So what you've done here, you had a system where you could feel the gravitational field of some sources everywhere. And by some uh, magical trick, which happens in this region between these two cones, you arrange to make the gravitational field vanish outside. Because in this region, you are in Minkowski space-time. No forces, no tidal forces, no accelerations, nothing happens here, right? In this region, you don't even know that there is a non-trivial gravitational field, right? So here, in this region, you're back in, two, in 1905, special relativity of Einstein. And all general relativity is happening now in this region. So this is uh, the title of my talk, Anti-Gravity, because uh, you have managed to kill off the gravity with this thing. How did you do this? Well, uh, the title is uh, probably misleading because you haven't introduced anti-gravity. You've only used gravitational fields. The data are still satisfying all the constraint equations. And if you solve your Einstein equation, you're going to get an empty space-time solution of Einstein equations with initial data being exactly Minkowskian here. Now, this is uh, mind-blowing. And I, it's hard to, you know, so first, it's hard to believe that it's true. Uh, something. Uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, it was 15 years ago, we had a program, a research program at the Mittag Le uh, Leffler Institute in Stockholm, and I went with Yvonne Jacques-Ebrua uh, to visit some museums, and we were chatting, and she said, what about if we make initial data which have our Schwarzschildian in this part and flat elsewhere? And I thought, no, come on, this is not possible. Just forget it. Uh, there's no way you can do this. And that was it. And so this was uh, so 10 years before your theorem. And so somehow people believed that you can do this, and they did it, right? So I just didn't believe it. Uh, all the techniques to do that, well, they're not, were not quite available the, uh, at the time, but they were almost there. I mean, there was just a few things to do. And, and I'm going to explain how to do this. Uh, in any case, why is this uh, shocking? if you're coming from Newtonian gravity. So Newtonian gravity is essentially something like that. Uh, these are matter sources. So I'm standing here. I have a density. And this table has a density. And everyone in this audience has a density. So this row describes everybody's uh, uh, density. And the point is that this row is positive, right? So this is Newtonian gravity, we believe matter density is positive. And then phi is, well, either the Newtonian potential or minus the poten Newtonian potential. Probably I could make a vote whether I have the sign correct here or not. 
the point is in France, you're using a different sign than everybody else. So, uh, for the new time. So, uh, I'm not going to write a sign. Let's just say that this is plus minus the Newtonian potential. There should be maybe some constants, four pi and g and whatever, but I'm just going to leave it like that. So Newton tells you, you give me rho, and I find phi. Okay? I find the potential which tells you how bodies interact gravitationally. So now, what would be the Newtonian equivalent of this configuration? Well, you would have phi no forces in a conical region, right? So in this, uh, the equivalent of this would be that you have a solution of the Laplace equation with rho and uh, which is actually no forces here, which means constant, right? Okay, so normally if you, uh, you probably want to take uh, isolated system, so rho would have compact support and phi will go to 1 at infinity. So if this, in this region phi is equal to 1 and rho is compactly supported, then Laplace phi is uh, 0 outside of this region. And uh, if you're coming from elliptic uh, PDEs, you know that this is absurd, except if phi is equal 1. But it's easy to, uh, if you're not, then the argument is very simple. Uh, if you have Laplace phi equals zero, on any open region where this holds, the solution is real analytic. Okay? So this is elliptic estimates. But if it's real analytic and equal one on an open region, it's going to be one on every connected component of the set which meets this region. So if it's one outside of this larger cone, it has to be one everywhere. But if it's one everywhere, then uh, well, you just take the uh, large sphere and calculate the gradient of phi on this sphere. And you take it large enough so that phi is 1, then gradient is 0. So this integral is 0, but it's the integral of a ball of Laplace phi. But uh, Laplace phi is rho. But rho has a sign. Whether it's positive or negative, it's up to you. I have chosen it to be positive. Zero, it has a sign, rho is zero, no matter it's empty space time. Okay? So such configurations do not exist in Newtonian gravity. And that was my, my reaction why when Yvonne suggested this, and uh, probably every physicist would have told you this, right? There's no way this can work. Well, so they tell you that this does, and so this is the uh, this is the the amazing fact here. Uh, well, once you can do it uh, once, you can repeat this construction uh, a few times, right? So, uh, so these are your two cones. Well, so uh, put two cones here and two other cones here and two other cones here and so forth, right? So, and you can pr produce a configuration when you have uh, flat initial data for uh, outside of these uh, regions, and in this region you have your original metric on some other metrics. I'm going to come to this later. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the time evolution of these things, but just uh, I think it's still worth to say a few words. Uh, so uh, we know that, or if you're familiar with hyperbolic PDEs, you will know that uh, they have a finite speed of propagation property that uh, information propagates at the speed of light uh, or not faster than the speed of light. Of course, it could just not propagate at all. If you have a static solution, then nothing propagates. But it doesn't propagate faster than the speed of light. So if you have something non-trivial in a cone region like that, uh, the information which is here, and this is at t equals 0 now, so that's not a space-time picture, but you look at t equals 0. The, propagation, the information which is here propagates at most of the speed of light, right? So the question is how, what will be the evolution of the space-time look like? Well, so if you look at information propagating out of this point as a, by speed of light, this is not just as time evolves, right? This would be just spheres or in space-time going to be a cone, right? So, so from this region, if you are at a, some light later time, you know that, well, 
the metric was flat outside. It's going to be certainly outside, flat remain outside of this region. Now, this thing has to move, can move with the speed of light outwards. And so it's uh, just a very simple exercise to see that this is the geometry you're going to get at, at time, at the later time, okay? So your space time was non-trivial here initially. And this is, uh, if you, you, have, you go at distance C delta T, and this is at a time delta T, how this region will look like, right? So essentially, it's not quite the same as cones, but it's similar because you can just continue this and get a cone. So you can think of this as a cone which is going, the tip is moving and uh, it's going a little bigger. But at every time you still have a cone which encompasses everything non-trivial here and you still have a lot of Minkowskian space, right? So of course if you're setting here, eventually this non-trivial field will catch up with you and uh, you can calculate the time it needs to catch up with you, and then you start seeing gravity. But until these counts have reached you, you have, uh, for you, there's, you're in flat space time. There's not, no matter out there. Now, from now on, I'm going to forget uh, Einstein equations. I'm just going, going to do Riemannian geometry uh, because uh, all the ideas are the same. Uh, it's just a little more messy uh, to do the general case. So, and this, uh, uh, this Riemannian geometry case is where you say, well, why don't we just forget k? I mean, or set k equals zero. Uh, in other words, in this case, this goes away and we get a zero here. And obviously, this is satisfied by zero, right? So this is called time symmetric initial data set. Time symmetric is easy to understand because uh, k equals zero means that the time derivative of, this, of the gravitational field is zero, but by uniqueness of solutions of hyperbolic equations, it means that the solution to the future will be exactly the same as the solution to the past, right? Because if you flip time, the time derivatives didn't change. They were zero, they remained zero. The field didn't change, so, uh, so this is a time symmetric configuration. But then you're only in the problem where r of g is zero, scalar flat Riemannian matrix, right? So, and so this theorem applies, of course, to uh, this situation. And well, it says you then, if you have a scalar flat asymptotically Euclidean matrix, or asymptotically flat, call it where you, whatever you want, uh, which, uh, uh, right? So then there exist uh, cones so that the metric is the original one inside here and is Euclidean outside. Okay, so that's the Riemannian version of the theorem. Uh, uh, so outside a slightly larger cone, you're going to get a uh, Euclidean metric. Uh, by the way, uh, all this works in a setting where you assume larger equals than zero, but uh, so just in this space. <laughs> which sounds maybe a little more interesting for mathematicians. It's a big part of... That's a in very interesting and active topic study, manifolds with positive scalar curvature. And so we can re one can repeat a lot of this with this uh, assumption. Let me just make it zero, it's just not to complicate things. So, so in this case, now we have zero. And we started with zero. We end up with zero, but now the metric is exactly flat outside this region, and it was whatever you wanted it to be inside. Now, why do you want to do this? Uh, so, of course, for the physics, I've already explained you how shocking it is, and therefore it was really worth doing. But uh, from the mathematics point of view, uh, this question of such a geometry arises naturally if you look at complete minimal surfaces. And uh, here, uh, there is a beautiful theorem of Alessandro Carlotto. Uh, 2016 is the year of publication, but it probably goes back to four or five years ago already, right? Uh, so, which says the following. So, suppose that you have a asymptotically Schwarzschildian manifold now, right? So, you have a, 
so we, we just forget about Kij. We just look at the scalar curvature problem and R of G uh, uh, rather than zero, just positive, right? So we have an asymptotic Euclidean, so metric goes to the uh, flat one, but not in not in this general way, but this very precise way, right? So the one over R term is controlled. And so what uh, Alessandro proves is that uh, if there is a stable minimal surface in there, then it has to be Euclidean space, right? So existence of a stable minimal surface in an asymptotically Schwarzschildian manifold implies Euclidean space. Uh, assuming, of course, that R is positive. Now, stable, uh, what is stable? Well, uh, essentially, it's a variational problem, right? So minimal surfaces are, uh, can be defined variationally, and stable means, uh, by the co uh, Alessandro will, 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 will probably shout if, when I say this, but it's just small variations uh, increase, uh, increase the area, right? Okay. Small compactly supported variations increase area, or small variations which decay sufficiently fast increase the area. So variationally, this is a minimal surface in, a, in this sense that a small motion of it will actually increase area. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Alessandro's theorem, and this tells you this is this asymptotic. Right? Now, if we have one of these uh, Carlotto Schon configurations where the metric is non-trivial here and uh, flat outside, then every plane like this is a stable minimal surface. Right? So this is a. a a proof that this theorem of, Carlo, uh, of, of Alessandro is actually optimal. In other words, if you assume asymptotic flatness, but you don't assume uh, Schwarzschildian asymptotics, but this weaker notion of asymptotics, then there are solutions which uh, behave like that. Uh, so, uh, so now, these solutions have the property, so you have this complete minimal surfaces, planes in, in the Euclidean part of the solution. Now, if you start making large deformation of this, they're going to, to hit this region, right? Uh, here, uh, so certainly these are stable minimal surfaces. Small deformations uh, do not decrease area. But now you can ask what happens if you take a large deformation which starts hitting this. And this is another beautiful theorem by now uh, Chodosh and Eichmeier uh, that uh, you assume asymptotic Euclidean, three-dimensional, positive scalar curvature, complete, non-compact, embedded, well, boundary, uh, but uh, think of this as a surface. Now, if it minimizes area with respect to all uh, compactly supported deformation, but they can be very large, it has to be uh, Euclidean space. Okay? So, uh, minimal with respect to all variations and asymptotically flat means Euclidean space. So, uh, this uh, tells you that these surfaces here actually will not be uh, completely minimizing uh, in, in this sense if, if you have these cones here. So, so this gives you a, flavor, a geometric flavor of how these things tie together. And uh, one question you can ask here in this, uh, when you're studying these manifolds of non-positive scalar curvature, can you localize non-flatness? Because, uh, and that was one, another question which was at the origin of the theorem. Uh, so the question is the following, if you have a manifold which has positive scalar curvature, can you have big regions where the metric is flat, period, right? And uh, there is already one answer known about it, uh, which is coming from the positive energy theorem. You cannot have a flat metric outside of a ball. So, 
suppose you have a non-trivial configuration where you have R is positive, something interesting happens inside, but outside of a large ball, it's flat. Well, the positive energy theorem tells you no way, because if it's flat outside of a, light, of a, uh, of a ball, then you can just make uh, the zero, so decay any as, we sh as fast as you want. This is just forget, we're just talking in the, uh, we're talking about the time symmetric case. So uh, then the mass will be zero, but if the mass is zero, the whole thing has to be Euclidean. This is the positive energy theorem. So you cannot have a non-trivial configuration where the fields are flat outside of a ball. Now you can have non-trivial configuration where the field is flat inside a ball. And this is uh, not obvious, uh, in vacuum especially. Uh, in Newtonian gravity, this is uh, rather simple. You just take a spherical hole, constant density between two spheres, then this is already a theorem known to uh, Isaac Newton, then the uh, gravitational field uh, potential will be constant in this region, and so there will be no, no gravitational forces here. Uh, now this requires, uh, there are other configurations of this kind, so Already Newton proved that uh, for ellipsoids it will also work. So if you take an ellipsoid with constant density. But there are many other configurations. The theorem by Kohn, Alain Kahn, and uh, Thibaut D'Amour, and uh, Cédric Fayet. Cédric Fayet? Is it Cédric Fayet? Well, Fayet anyway. Construct a lot of configuration where you have uh, complicated geometries and no, uh, no uh, Newtonian forces inside, but of course all these configurations by this analysis argument I have told you have to be enclosed by matters, right? You cannot have a configuration where you would have, you could go to infinity here because by analyticity everything will just be again a constant as before. So these things have to close off. Now there's a construction due to Bartnik uh, of uh, scalar flat metrics where, which uh, are obtained by uh, so you start with uh, something here, and you solve a parabolic equation outside. So if you use this construction of Bartnik, you can start with a flat Euclidean metric here, and put something non-trivial outside, it will be asymptotically flat. So you'll get an equivalent of this kind of solutions uh, without matter even, right? So for just empty space-time or scalar flat Euclidean metrics which do this. So you can suddenly have uh, compact regions where you have no gravitational field. You cannot have uh, complements of a ball. That's what already we've discussed, right? You cannot have a complement of a ball on which you have no gravitational field. But this uh, theorem of uh, uh, Alessandro and Rick tells you that you can actually have flat things on a very large region outside of a cone. Now, you could ask yourself, well, is the cone the best one can do? And uh, indeed, it has to do with this formula. So, suppose, can, can you just have a solution where the metric is flat here, flat here, and non-flat in this region, right? So, cone of, of zero aperture or between two planes, something like that. Well, if you look at this, this formula, you can see that if you go to infinity uh, with the spheres, then uh, this is asymptotically flat, this decays, but the angular region over which you're integrating, if you're shifting, if you're moving the spheres larger and larger, shrinks down, so that if the further you go, the smaller this region is, so you're going to get zero at the end. So, this argument, just based on this formula and a uh, slab, is tell you that this is not possible either. You cannot have flat, flat, and the slab with non-trivial asymptotically flat behavior. Of course, maybe something not asymptotically flat could happen here, but uh, asymptotically flat is not possible. So, uh, so this theorem produces a lot of examples uh, where flatness, uh, where there's a lot of flatness, and it looks it's really optimal 
in some sense, and uh, uh, you cannot do much better than this, right? So these counts seem to be the, the best thing you can do in the business. Time evolution, we already mentioned this. Yes, yeah, so what's another a corollary of this construction? How do you construct uh, initial data sets for many body problems? In uh, Newtonian gravity, so remember Laplace phi equal rho, uh, you have a solution with rho 1, you have a solution with rho 2, you just add them, you're going to get a solution plus of rho 1 plus rho 2 finished, right? There's nothing to do. Here, there is this terrible equation which tells you, well, wait, you can't just superpose things. So you have your favorite black hole here, another one there, and you want to see how they merge and calculate numerically their wave fronts, then you cannot just add them, right? You need to do something to uh, preserve this condition. And so this construction allows you to do that. So this is your first black hole, say it says 40 solar masses. This one has 30, it's slightly smaller and they're rotating together. Well, you would like them to rotate together, so this is in its own space-time. This one is in its own space-time. Well, you just take this one and cut off uh, these two cones region here, and you put flat data outside, right? You do the same with the other guy, uh, but you just put flat data in a different uh, region, right? So you cut this one off like that, you cut this one off like that, you put them together, uh, putting together flat space-time is trivial, uh, just, there's nothing to superpose, it's just there. And so you have your uh, two-body configuration. So this is uh, um, how you can construct two-body and then of course you can iterate this as I've already shown you in the first uh, picture, right? So this you can just get many-body solutions by by putting your favorite metric here and your other metric here and your third metric here and so forth. Uh, by the way, such a construction was already known. Uh, I'm involved in this with uh, uh, Justin Corvino and James Eisenberg where uh, we did a gluing like that, uh, but our gluing was on compact regions. So rather than, not, than taking a complete uh, uh, a region which goes to infinity and which belongs to this solution, we were just working with balls. So you enclose this guy by a large ball, you enclose this guy by a large ball, and you put them together in a new initial data set, again by a gluing construction, by making sure that this equation is preserved. So uh, this uh, method has an obvious advantage that uh, you preserve much bigger portions of your original manifold than other ours. Okay? So we are just preserving a large region, but a finite volume region. Here are actually preserving an infinite volume region of your original favorite initial data set. Good. So this is the context. These are the implications. And the question is, how do you do this? And the way it goes is the PP star method. And before, I'm going to uh, run you a simpler problem uh, where, where I, one, one can just follow every step without many complications. So I'm just going to uh, illustrate how this works on a source-free electric field. So this is about Maxwell equations. One of the Maxwell constraints, Maxwell equations in Minkowski space-time uh, require that the, if you don't have any sources, and that's what we want to do, that the electric field has zero divergence. And I'm going only to, uh, to look at this. So the question is, uh, how much freedom do you have with uh, fine constructing solutions like that? And the equivalent problem of the one that uh, Alessandro and Rick did would be, suppose that you have a solution of an electric field on R3. Can you localize it in a cone so that you get zero field outside? Okay? So without changing it in this, in this region. Right? So this is the equivalent problem. How can we do this? Now this is a, 
uh, linear equation, which I'm going to write like P equals zero. So P is the divergence operator. And the trick is, as I uh, said, uh, P star uh, P method. So, uh, so P is the divergence. And P star, what's the adjoint of, of the divergence? Uh, we need to do uh, integration by parts. Uh, anyone remembers? It's probably minus the gradient, right? So minus the gradient. So, uh, so the thing is that now P, P star is the minus divergence of a gradient which in my not notation is minus Laplacian, and this is an isolyptic operator, right? So uh, how can I try to produce a solution uh, with the properties like that? Let me take a function chi, which is one uh, in the smaller cone, and is zero outside the larger one. And let's look at the field chi times the original one. And let me call the original one E1, OK? So, uh, so chi E1, where E1 was the original one. E1 original field. So now with this cutoff function, chi E1 will be exactly the original one in the smaller cone. It will vanish outside the larger cone. So. Uh, it looks like almost what I want, except that, of course, now the divergence of E is uh, not if, uh, let me call this E chi, uh, the divergence of E chi isn't zero anymore, right? Because there's no reason for it to be zero, right? So, so because divergence of E1 is, but if you just take a divergence of this, you're going to get the derivatives of chi hitting E1. No reason for this to vanish, right? So now we have to correct for the for this error. And the way I'm going to do this is uh, I don't need much of this now, so. So I'm going to write my electric field as uh, E chi plus a correction, right? So plus a correction, so let's say uh, delta E. Well, this is a correction term. And we want now delta E should be 0 inside the smaller so that I get E is equal E1 inside the smaller and outside the larger. So now, uh, if I can do this, and uh, then uh, I will be done. And now I have a, uh, an equation for, so in other words, E will only happen between the two light cones, will be non-trivial out in the, that's kind of, and of course, the divergence of E, this should be 0, is the divergence of E chi plus divergence of delta E. So. Choose the, your equation to be right, a divergence of delta E is minus divergence E chi, and then you're done. But now you have to do this if you can solve this equation like that. And of course, this equation is just a, a gradient of delta E. Well, so the divergence, so well, div of of delta E uh, is 0. And uh, so this is my, uh, so what's the PP star business? Uh, so let, let me just try to do this like that. Uh, if I can solve the equation PP star chi is equal minus D e chi. And P star, remember, was minus the gradient. So gradient of the function phi is equal minus divergence of E chi then I will be done. But you're going to say, well, but of course, this is now very easy. I just have a Laplace equation. I can solve this, and uh, the problem is, is finished. Well, except that 
uh, I still want that uh, DE vanishes at both boundaries. So we have these two cones. And this DE, which is grad phi, or minus grad phi, should be 0 here. Well, actually, phi you don't care. But the gradient of phi should be 0 on this. And the gradient of phi should be 0 on this. And this isn't good, right? This isn't good. Because uh, if you solve the Laplace equation, you can say, for example, give uh, Dirichlet data, so phi equals 0 and phi another constant maybe here, so 5 on this thing. Then, of course, you can solve the problem then. Uh, but uh, so the gradient of phi tangential to the cones will be obviously 0, but uh, there's no reason for the transverse one to be 0. Right? So, this, uh, so therefore, this DE will not vanish at the boundary. Now you can say, OK, good, but this is, I was stupid. I can do the Neumann problem. The Neumann problem says I can give the normal derivative of phi here and to be 0 and find a solution. Supposing I can do this, uh, first you know that there are problems with the Neumann problem. There are constraints. But regardless of that, uh, once you found your solution, there is no reason that the solution be constant on the cones. And therefore, if it's not constant on the cones, then the tangential gradient will not be zero, right? So you can't win, right? So in this method, you can't win. And the miracle is the PP star method with weight, which has the following. Suppose you just try to solve the equation P psi square P star phi is zero, where psi goes to zero at the boundary, to zero at the boundary very fast. Okay, so, so now, if you solve the thing, well, not zero, but this uh, minus divergence. Now, remember that this would be, so this was, in other words, minus divergence, or divergence minus psi square grad phi is equal, whatever it's supposed to be equal. Now, if psi goes to zero very fast, this is your correction then it's going to do what you, 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 uh, you said to do, right? Good. So this is the trick. And in fact, it works. And uh, uh, so of course, putting a weight here doesn't change the symbol of the operator, because it's still, uh, well, psi square Laplace. Now, if psi goes to 0, it changes the symbol a little bit because it's going to be singular at the boundary. Right? So at the boundary, something bad is going to happen. But inside, it's still elliptic. So you know a lot of things about these equations. So maybe you can just do it. And how would you do this? Well, in this case, it's actually a variational equation. So this equation, let me just write it. Uh, let me call this rho chi to avoid. Uh, this is a variational equation for the functional, and maybe uh, you can correct me. I'm never sure about the signs. So do I need so there's a plus or minus in here. Right? Anyway, just take the earlier Lagrange equations for this. This one is going to produce a psi square Laplace phi with a minus. So you need a minus or a plus? Depends in France, it's minus. <laughs> <laughs> a minus here, right? All right, so if I do a variational problem with this, I'm going to get integrate by part. I'm going to get this. From this, I'm going to get minus rho. And with this sign, OK, thank you very much. <laughs> I think that this is. C'est bon, c'est pas bon. Oops. Well, the point was exactly that. This is this is what I wanted, right? Okay. Okay. Good. So the one half is there because there is a square here, and this is exactly the. And there is a minus, and this one will produce minus rho chi equals zero. Okay. So that's the variational equation coming from this functional. And this is exactly the equation we want. Good. 
Good. So now if I can minimize this functional, and why not? I mean, just as trivial. I mean, we, we teach this to our, maybe not first years, but uh, at least at master or something like that, before we do this. Uh, then it would be OK. Now, good. So let me, I'm going to come back to the question whether we can solve this problem or not and what we need to solve it. But uh, uh, why does it work at all? Right? Because now I'm going to minimize this thing. Well, where? In the space of functions where this is finite. So now psi goes to 0 at the boundary may be very fast. In fact, I want to think as psi as being something like that, where x is the distance to the boundary. Maybe. Or maybe you can just take powers or something like that. But so if you just take this, then of course it's going to vanish faster than any polynomial at the boundary. So the, it's going to be as smooth as you want at this boundary. But now if you minimize this, this goes to zero very fast. The integral is finite. So this thing is going to likely to blow. So have I gained something? Because now I have a phi which is singular. I still have my psi which goes to zero. Phi is singular. Maybe uh, this field is going to be very bad. And the miracle is it's not. And the way you can think of it is as follows. So in a nice world, suppose that this integral is finite, then uh, maybe grad phi will be bounded. That's certainly what our students will tell us, right? So, fonction integrable borné. Uh, maybe not, but I mean, integrable functions are not very, uh, right, so psi, okay, so, so this, right, so, so this should be integrable, so psi square grad phi square. It's wrong, of course, we know it's wrong, and integrable function can blow up, but it cannot blow up very widely, right? So maybe like 1 over square root is still the threshold here, right? 1 over square root of the distance to the boundary. Good. So, so therefore, maybe it's not going to be a constant, but a function which is not too wide, right? <coughs> so we know that from the fact that we've minimized in a class where this is bounded, we're going to have something in this spirit, which means that psi grad phi will be roughly bounded. But here, we get psi square. So E is psi times this. So psi, this might blow up a little bit. In fact, you can just, uh, if you do your analysis right, indeed, it's going to be 1 or x square root of the distance to the boundary. Right? So this is going to blow up a little bit. But now if you keep it with a very high power of psi, so psi, you can just put a very high power to the, of the distance to the boundary, all this exponential, you're going to kill off this blow up, and then you're going to get a solution which is smooth. So this is the miracle of the P, uh, P star method with weights, provided you can make it work. Well, how do you make it work? You have to make sure that you can, uh, that this function that is uh, coercive, OK? Functional coercive, uh, founded from below, lacks milligram, or take your uh, elementary introduction to Hilbert spaces. You have to make sure that this thing is uh, uh, coercive, and the thing to guarantee this would be an inequality roughly of the spirit that integral of phi square. You need some weighted weighted Sobolev inequality. Right? If you can prove something like that with this crazy weight, then you're going to be able to minimize this because this term will be bounded, controlled, and, uh, uh, and then you, you will have solved your problem. Right? Actually, it turns out that this isn't quite the right inequality. You, you, there is a little loss here, so uh, you, get, you have to put a, another weight function somewhere. But essentially, this is the kind of inequalities you're, you have to prove when you want to do this. And so, indeed, this works for this problem. Well, however, with difficulties. Because now, uh, this is a theory of Laplace equation, but in an infinite domain. Right? So, in an infinite domain, with this funny weights at the boundary, 
So there are difficulties coming from the fact that uh, you're going to infinity, and they're taken care of by putting some extra radial ways here. And uh, uh, in fact, you put another R here. Okay, so this is the kind of things you have to prove. And uh, the right inequality, a weighted Poincaré inequality here, would be something like that, where you take this function uh, and you get some, maybe some power of R here as well. This is your psi, and you get uh, a function chi, which is uh, x squared over R, where x is the distance to the boundary. So take a function which is a distance to the boundary to the light count, to the x counts. Uh, if, if you have just standard counts like that, uh, what's a good distance is uh, the angle. Uh, except the distance will go up. Right, okay, so this will be something like that. Right? So uh, a good function uh, for this case, if you have uh, opening angles theta 0 and theta 1 would be This works. And this is what Carlotta and Sean show. It's a, a substantial part of the argument to show that if you put weight functions like that, uh, here they take powers rather than uh, this exponential, but it's essentially the same calculations, then you can prove a Poincaré inequality in this spirit. It's a con considerable part of the work. and. Uh, so I've told you this is the PP star method for the electric field. How does it work for the uh, Einstein equations? Uh, this one. Oh, I'm out of time. Okay. So uh, yeah. So 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 now, of course, uh, you repeat this, but for these equations, right? So. Uh, your equations are the constraint equations. You want this to be zero. Uh, this is the constraint equations just written as a set of equations here. So now we calculate P. What will be P? Will be the linear, linearization, right? We want to, here was a linear problem. How do we get a linear problem out of this? Just linearize, right? So you calculate P. I didn't write it out as a mess. And then you calculate P star, and P star is this mass. And P star is a map which has uh, two functions, uh, well, two objects. One is a function n, and, y, and one is a vector field. A function because this is a scalar equation, and a vector field because this is a vector equation, right? So this is a P star, and then you want to solve the PP star equation using this method, proving weighted inequalities. This is a mass, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in the simpler case where you're only Riemannian, forget the kij and y, then this would be this operator, right? It's not that bad now anymore. Uh, so this is this operator, your p star. Uh, you need to make sure that there is no kernel. You have to put in all these uh, radial weights, and they have to be, have the right behavior. Otherwise, you're going to get kernel problems and so forth. So all this has been worked out in there, and, uh, and this is there. The theorem, right? So let me just go again to my first page, right? So just to run. Well, let, let me just run the Riemannian case, right? So scalar flat, asymptotically clear metric, you can find cones, and a new metric, which is what you started here inside and started outside. Uh, I apologize for being uh, over time, so just two comments how you can generalize this. Uh, well, they did this with cones, but you can do it with uh, uh, any set which looks like a cone. Uh, so a, a cone in a mathematical sense. So just take a, a sphere. On this sphere, take your uh, su a submanifold, and you just make it conical by blowing it uh, to, uh, to infinity. In other words, uh, at large distances, you set omega on which you're going to do the... Omega would be the set between the two cones. 
So now, instead of doing a set between the two cones, you just take a set lambda omega s, where lambda is in, zero, in one infinity, and omega s is a, a subset of a sphere of radius r. And so uh, you choose any submanifold, smooth submanifold of the sphere, which has exactly two boundaries. Doesn't matter, because if you iterate the construction, you can have as many boundaries as you want, but just for one step, choose a subset of a sphere, any smooth mass of manifold which has exactly two boundaries, and then you make it uh, conical by this construction, right? So just here I've drawn a random curve on, on the sphere and just blow it up. So the region omega would be the region between, between these two surfaces. This is another one, right, where, so, so in this example, you'll have a flat metric, say, above, and you're not flat metric below. Here, I've just taken a curve, which lies on a kind of spirals from the north to south pole. Now, you flatten this curve a little bit to get a submanifold, and then you uh, make it a cone, and then the flat metric will be, say, inside uh, between these two curves, and the non-trivial metric will be outside these two curves. Uh, you can iterate this and get nice pictures. So, for example, this is your omega S set. So you decide you want a, maybe a flat metric in the violet things, and a Schwarzschild metric is positive mass here, and a Schwarzschild metric is negative mass here, and you, you fatten up a little the boundaries to get this interface, and uh, you iterate the construction a finite number of times, you're going to get a, a set which looks like that, where the metric is scalar, zero scalar curvature and has these many uh, regions with different behaviors. Okay, so uh, you can actually do it an infinite number of times as well, uh, as long as it's countable. Uh, then there's only, the only catch is that uh, each time, after you've, had fi you've made 50 additions, the next one you might have to go a little further to make the next one, right? So if you have an infinite number of, uh, of regions where you have, want to add things, for each region you might have to go a little further. But you can still get this infinite number of regions, right? So at any fixed sphere, as many as you want, which look like this one. So the fi finite set, a uh, uh, finite thing I wanted to mention is that you can actually go a little beyond cones, not much, but a little beyond, by making logarithmic rotations. And this is my last remark. And so this goes as follows. So suppose that R of t is a rotation around, uh, say, the z-axis. So a matrix, right? So rotation matrix. And so if you just did something like Rx, this would just re rotate the vector x around the, the axis. But what you can do is just to make it rotate uh, like, like that, maybe. So at every radius, make a slightly different rotation, right? So uh, I've put this number so that it's, there's no singularity at r equals 0. Uh, so you make, you go to a larger sphere. So you rotate the sphere, the larger one is rotated faster, and still, and, and again, larger one is rotated faster. So if you, uh, so out of this you get a logarithmic spiral, right? So this is, you just took a point and rotated it, you get a spiral. So if you think of your two cones uh, just being here, right? So this is what, what you're going to get uh, when you apply this transformation. So this still works in this problem. This is not in their paper, but it's uh, in the paper which I wrote with Erwan Dole, and it's on archive since yesterday. <laughs> so uh, uh, so I, I like this picture of a logarithmic rotation applied to a tennis ball curve, right? So a tennis ball curve is just this curve uh, which winds around a tennis ball. So if you make a cone over it, that's what it's going to look like. And so, uh, so if you just did a straightforward Carlotta Schongluing, you'll get a say flat metric below and non-trivial above. But now if you make a logarithmic rotation on this, you're going to get a, 
uh, we had uh, geometry out of this, and uh, this is all I wanted to say. Uh, apologies for being over time. Thank you. So I, I'll ask one. Uh, in the statement you wrote in the first slide, you said that there exist cones, but uh, if I understand well, you can choose them. Right. Well. So you can choose, a, a, so given any metric, uh, there is a threshold rate and any opening angles, there is a threshold radius so that you can put them further than this radius. So any cones with this, uh, choose two opening angles, uh, then you put them sufficiently far away, you're going to be able to do this. Yeah, so like, like Piotr was saying, the, you know, that was a, an accessible statement. Like actually, the, the, the true statement... This is, by the way, <laughs> Alessandro Carlotto, one of the authors <laughs> of the book. <laughs> the true statement is pretty long and, and technical, but the idea is that given any initial data set and given any couple of cones, uh, if you place the tip of the cone sufficiently far out in the flat, in the asymptotical flat region, then the construction works. So we don't, you know, there's, a, there's full flexibility about the choice of the cone, provided they are far out. And probably I would like to add a second remark, which is also, I would say, close to the spirit of your presentation, is that something quite surprising about our construction is that we can get full approximation of the ADM energy momentum tensor, uh, sorry, of the ADM energy momentum <laughs> for vector, if you want, provided we choose the tip of the cone far out. So even if the angles are tiny, you know, 10 and 20 degrees, then as we let the, the tip of the cone drift to infinity, we can capture, uh, you know, 99% of the mass of the initial data, which means, from a different perspective, that there's a crazy concentration of mass phenomena in the transition region between the two cones. And that's, of course, very surprising. Thank you. Any other questions? Also, next time. Thank you.